Welcome, everyone. Good to see you. My name is Misty Denman. I'm part of the Women in the Word teaching team. So glad to be with you here today. And I'm going to tell you that I have never, ever in my life thought about walls or fences so much as I have in the last um, week or two. Whoever knew that I would have walls and fences on my mind so much? It's a fairly... um, serious topic. And so earlier in the week, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to start out with something funny. So I'm not a joke teller, but I can Google jokes well. So I'm going to Google funny wall or fence jokes. Here's what you need to know. There were more than 10 pages of possibilities for jokes about walls and fences. I went through about three of them before I decided there's no funny wall or fence jokes. They weren't even clever. There were a few puns that were all right, but not worth telling. So then I started looking at, I thought, okay, if we can't think of funny um, walls and fences, I kind of am interested in the important walls and fences throughout history. And actually, when I Googled that, I realized that Protective boundaries and walls have played a huge role in history. And the first one that came to mind was the Great Wall of China. And so I looked up some things about that. And it's really an amazing and remarkable structure. And of course, we've all heard our kids tell us that it's the only man-made structure that you can see from space. But as I looked at some pictures of it, I realized it was both really beautiful and intricate and enormous given when it was made and how it was made, but its real purpose was to keep out um, invaders from China, and it's still there and still sort of speaks of the history of that time and place, which is remarkable. Um, Then I began thinking about the Berlin Wall, which actually did play a part in my childhood. I, um, for most of my childhood and through, I guess, high school, college age, um, it was the middle or the end, really, of the Cold War. And there that, that image, that ugly Berlin Wall that separated the East and the West there in Germany really um, stands out to me still. And the memory of the, first of all, the stories that I remember reading and hearing about where the misery that that separation caused and the joy when that wall came down and families were united who hadn't been together in 20 or 30 years. And there's really um, many more stories like that through history. And then really on a more personal note, I thought there is not one um, home behind a wall that I have ever passed through that I'm not, or passed by that all of a sudden I'm not incredibly curious what's behind it. I may not have cared what either house on either side looked like, but if something has a wall behind it, all of a sudden I've just sort of got to know, and can you peek through it, and is there a little hole between the gate? And So anyway, walls were not our idea. Um, long before any, the, the Great Wall of China or the Berlin Wall or those walls that um, hide really lovely and beautiful homes came into existence. God created a wall around his dwelling place. So let's, um, let's find out more about that today. But I want to begin with a bit of review and just sort of step back and remember that all of the instructions for the temple um, or for the tabernacle constructions, construction and its furnishings were given to Moses by God when he was atop Mount Sinai for those 40 days in God's presence. Moses was to take all of those blueprints that God gave him back to his people, and the people were to follow those blueprints exactly. And much to um, Israel's credit, that is exactly what they did. But why build that incredibly costly and laborious, portable place of worship in the desert before they even got to their permanent dwelling place in their home in the promised land? It's because the living God wanted to dwell right there among his people. He wanted the lives of his people to be centered around him. He wanted them to remember that he was holy and perfect, and yet he loved his people and their wandering sinful hearts so much that he pursued them and made a way to be possible for him to dwell right among them even before they got to the promised land. The tabernacle and its furnishings and the wall around that courtyard were part of God's plan for his people to worship him and to have fellowship with him. So we're going to begin today in Exodus 27, verse 9. I'm going to read verses 9 through 15. I'd love it if you followed along with me. 
You shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side of the court shall have hangings of fine twined linen, a hundred cubits long for one side. Its twenty pillars and their twenty bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for its length on the north side there shall be hangings a hundred cubits long, its pillars twenty and their bases twenty of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side there shall be hangings for fifty cubits with ten pillars and ten bases. Um, We're going to keep going. The breadth of the court at the front on the east shall be of fifty cubits. The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits with their three pillars and three bases. On the other side of the hanging shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and three bases. Okay, I know that's a lot of cubits and a lot of pillars, so we're going to make sense of all of that. I want you to drop down now to verse 17. All of the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their bases of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, the breadth 50, and the height 5 cubits, with hangings of fine twined linen and bases of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle for every use, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. So once these walls, which would have created a courtyard around the tabernacle itself, Um, were enclosed, you would also have within there the bronze laver for ceremonial washing and then the um, um, bronze altar of burnt sacrifices. We'll learn about those next week. And then there would have been an open area within that courtyard as well. We've got a picture of what that might have looked like. So you have the um, white walls with the, you can see the pillars there. You can also see that beautiful gate. We're going to talk more about that later. And then if you were to zoom out more, just beyond the the, um, the laver, the wash basin there at the top, you would see there the tabernacle itself in the Holy of Holies. The entire area Within those walls was holy ground. Those walls provided a protective boundary around the tabernacle and where God's spirit dwelt. It's nor- it was oriented north, south, east, west. The north and south walls were 100 cubits long, or that would have been about 150 feet long. And the east and west walls were 75 feet long. So you formed a rectangle there. And just to give you an idea of how big that space was, 150 feet is about half the length of a football field. The 75 feet wide is, again, about half the width of the football field. So half the length, half the width. But when you enclosed it in an area, that would have been about one-fourth the area of a football field. So you could have fit about four, if you wanted to, um, tabernacle the whole complex with its courtyard or walls within a football field, which is honestly smaller than I originally envisioned it to be. But it was big enough for members of the community to walk in, to worship, to offer their sacrifices, to gather, um, and for the priests to perform their daily duties. It wasn't big enough for huge groups to come together all at once, but All of Israel was welcome within those walls, which we'll talk more about. The walls were seven and a half feet tall, about the same height as what a wooden privacy fence in a normal backyard um, that we're familiar with might have looked like. The um, linen curtains would have been made very skillfully from flax that was grown in the area. And the really neat thing is that linen would have been bright white, which would have stood out in really great contrast to all of the brown that would have been all around the desert surrounding them. And those bright white walls were a visual reminder of the purity and holiness of God. We might remember from last week that the tabernacle coverings were 15 feet tall, that tent around um, the holy place and the most holy place. So the courtyard walls were half the height of the tabernacle itself. And as a passerby walked by, you would be able to see over and see to the top half of the tabernacle itself. But it would have given a real measure of 
privacy as to what was happening inside. A casual passerby wouldn't have just been able to walk past and just kind of glance in and know what was going on there. The white linen fabric was held up by stout pillars set at regular intervals. There would have been probably some kind of thinner pole along the top. The fabric was attached both along the top and then down along the sides too so that it would have been taut and so that it wouldn't flap open in the wind. Much like an actual wall would be more than uh, what we think of as swinging curtains. The upright pillars were probably made from acacia wood like much of the rest of the tabernacle. We're not entirely sure. The bases of those pillars which touched the ground were made from bronze. That was the least valuable metal used in the tabernacle construction. And they would have had to have been wide enough and heavy enough to hold up those stout pillars and to support the thick linen curtains that were there. Their fasteners were made from silver and I imagine that would have gleamed so beautifully and brightly along with those white linen walls. So if you ever wondered where all that gold and silver and even bronze came from, it's estimated that there was about one ton of gold and more than three tons of silver used in the construction of the tabernacle. And that doesn't count all of the bronze. There was lots of that as well. And it's a really interesting answer where it all came from. To begin with, a lot of it was straight from Egypt. You may remember when we studied the um, Exodus last year that just before um, God was about to take Israel out of Egypt, he told the people to simply ask the Egyptians around them for their gold and jewels. They did that, and then God miraculously compelled them to just hand it over. And so when Israel... um, went across the Red Sea there and escaped from Egypt. They were laden down in their hands and their pockets and their pouches with unspeakable riches from Egypt that had just been handed to them by God's glory. Then after they were wandering in the wilderness, they had a battle, you may remember, with um, uh, Amalek. And that was the battle where They're fighting Amalek. At this point, they would have been probably pretty ragtag, pretty tired, certainly hadn't been trained um, in their lives as slaves to be an effective military. And yet, Moses stood up on the hill there, if you remember. And when his arms were raised, Israel prevailed. And then as he lowered his arms when they got tired, they would begin to lose. And so remember that there were other men who came and held up his arms all throughout the day. God miraculously Um, caused Israel to completely uh, destroy Amalek, and there would have been probably plunder taken from there as well. That's also where some of the gold and silver and money would have come from that they used to build the tabernacle. But there was one other um, really interesting source of that gold and silver, and that was from a census tax. Look with me on your verse sheet at Exodus 11, or Exodus chapter 30, verse 11 through 13. It's actually in the middle of your page. The Lord said to Moses, When you take a census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, so that there shall be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel. And then skip on, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. So every man in Israel, regardless of his means, had an equal part to play there in the building of the tabernacle. Everybody had skin in the game here. Now, the most important thing about the courtyard walls is that they provided a clear and protective boundary for God's dwelling place. Outside those walls was Israel's camp. All the ordinary stuff of life happened there, common ground. But inside of the walls, it was holy ground. And that holy ground was to be deeply respected because it was God's presence that dwelt there. This concept of God setting up protective boundaries wasn't new to Israel. About three months after God had delivered the people from Egypt, 
They come as they're wandering in the wilderness to Sinai. They encamp at the bottom of the mountain there, Mount Sinai, where um, Moses is as we are reading the scripture today. But before, and then God calls Moses up to that mountain to speak with him. Before the first time that he calls Moses up, before he descends in that thick cloud to meet with him there, in the sight of all Israel, preparations were made. God ordered very uh, specific plans. Look with me at Exodus 19. That's at the very top of your verse sheet. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. And then a little later on in verses 21 through 23, And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people, lest they break through to to the Lord to look, and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. These set limits were the beginning of a pattern of worship that would be continued here at the tabernacle. Mount Sinai was set apart as holy because God's presence would be there. Those limits, not touching the mountain, not even sending their animals to graze around the mountain, taught the people to take God seriously and to carefully regard him as holy. God's spirit dwells here in the tabernacle. And like the boundaries that God established around Mount Sinai, the courtyard walls serve as a boundary now. So when you saw those fine white walls and then the much taller walls of the tabernacle within, you knew that you were close to God's spirit and that you were to approach with reverence and with holy fear. Now, God wanted to dwell among his people. There is so much mercy and grace in that, considering um, who they were and some of the mistakes that they had made. God was near to them, and he made a way to dwell among them. But there was still a wall of separation between him and his people. As Christians today, we have the unspeakable privilege of having God's Spirit dwelling not at a remote location behind layers of walls, but within us. And that was made possible, of course, by Jesus being our perfect sin sacrifice. And as I've been studying this lesson, I've really begun to slow down a bit when I approach God in worship and prayer um, in light of the truth of the work uh, that had to happen on Jesus' part to um, take that separation away. And I've really been just trying to cultivate a spirit of gratitude and just pondering that truth as I pray and worship that it was because of Jesus' death and resurrection that there is no longer any separation between God and his people. It's a great glory and a great grace and mercy. I've also begun to slow down a bit and just think about the holiness of God and to cultivate a more I think reverent spirit as God was trying to teach his people um, as he dwelt at the tabernacle to remember that God is holy and pure. Look with me at Hebrews 12. It has um, been encouraging to me. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And then also Psalm 86 right above it. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Like Israel, we should remember the holiness of God as we walk through our daily lives. So let's continue on. I want to read verses 13 through 16. Now, I know we already read a couple of those verses a second ago, but we've got some really specific architecture here. We're going to be focusing in this next session section on the entrance gate and that eastern wall. So let's just look at verses 13 through 16. The breadth of the court on the front to the east shall be 50 cubits, 
The hangings for the one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three bases. On the other side, the hangings shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three bases. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen embroidered with needlework. It shall have four pillars and with them four bases. So when I think of the word gate, I always think of, first of all, either a backyard gate that you're always coming in and out of or a big swinging metal gate like you might have around sort of a, um, a cow pasture or something like that. This gate, however, was made of fabric and it was probably, though we're not sure, opened by being pushed all the way to one side, sort of like what you're used to seeing a stage curtain being pulled um, up and pushed together on the side of a stage and then back across again. It was probably made from one single piece of very fine fabric. It would be able to be moved across those four posts and it may have been opened and closed by cords uh, so that that rich and costly fabric wouldn't have been damaged or defiled by being touched and pulled on every day. Now like I mentioned earlier the east and the west ends of the courtyard were 75 feet that would have been exactly half as long as the north and south sides they were created from these 10 upright pillars those were spaced seven and a half feet apart the entrance gate then would be 30 feet wide which is quite a large opening that was plenty wide enough for both people to come through and then also for the livestock which would have been offered a sacrifice within those courtyard walls. Now I want to look again at the picture we saw earlier. This is perhaps something like what the um, entrance gate would have looked like. In my own mind it's actually more uh, brilliant and more beautiful in its coloring and its pattern. But you get the idea here that it was separate and different from the walls around it, that it was quite a wide opening. That fabric was from blue and purple and scarlet. Uh, it was embroidered together with skillful um, and fine needlework. It was the same fabric and colors that were used to make that innermost curtain over the tabernacle and the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. Scholars believe that the pattern of the colors put together would have probably been the same as those curtains um, and that fabric at the tabernacle itself. The difference is that uh, is the cherubim. There were cherubim um, embroidered on the on that on that beautiful fabric at the tabernacle. Some people also think there were there were cherubim at the entrance gate. I personally don't think there was. It's not specifically mentioned as it is with the tabernacle. Um, also, you always see cherubim in connection with a really closeness and the glory of God, which wouldn't have been as true at the entrance gate as it was closer in there at the tabernacle, but we don't know for sure. What we do know is that that blue and purple and scarlet, scarlet fabric were beautiful and they were meaningful. Blue spoke of heaven and the eternal dwelling place of God and his people. Purple was the color of royalty. It reminded us that God is the one true king of heaven and earth. And that scarlet fabric spoke of the blood sacrifice that was necessary for sinful man to make peace with holy God. Given its beauty and its contrast to the white walls on either side of that gate... Those who entered or who looked at it would have had a real opportunity to consider God, uh, to prepare their hearts for worship as they passed through. The fact that the entrance gate was on the east side of the sanctuary was purposeful and significant, which should come as no surprise to us at this point. Look with me at Genesis 3.24 on your verse sheet. He, God, drove out the man... And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword, sword that turned, away, uh, turned everyone away to guard the, tree, the way to the tree of life. The entrance gate into the Garden of Eden 
and the entrance gate in the, to the courtyard both faced east. Now, Eden was created to be a place where God and man walk together in perfect, perfect fellowship. The tabernacle and its courtyard are almost like a type of Eden. That perfect fellowship with God was broken through Adam's sin. But here at the tabernacle, God's spirit again dwells. It was a place of worship. Like Eden, it was a place of splendid beauty. At the tabernacle, Israel could again see something of what God intended life to be like, um, a place of beauty, a place of worship, and a place of fellowship with the Lord. We know from our previous weeks of study that the tabernacle complex didn't only look back at Eden, it also looked forward to Jesus and our salvation. The entrance gate of the courtyard and the tabernacle even, I think, look all the way forward to the splendor of heaven when one day God will be on his throne and every believer will get to walk through the gates of heaven and worship all together around him in everlasting um, glory. Each week as we study a piece of God's dwelling place among or among his men on earth, we can also look forward, I think, to the day when we get to dwell with God in glory forever. Look with me at Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generation. So here's another amazing thing. The entrance gate was the one and only way into the courtyard, into that holy ground, and to the tabernacle itself. Because God chose for his special presence to dwell there at the tabernacle, it was the single way by which his people could draw near to him there. The gate into the tabernacle points us toward Jesus Just as there is only one way into God's presence at the tabernacle courtyard, so there is only one way to approach God's presence, and that's through the Son, or through the blood of His Son, Jesus. Jesus even calls Himself the gate. Look with me at John 10 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. Some of your Translations may say door. The idea is the very same. It's only through Jesus, our gate, that we come into the presence of our Father. Again, in the book of John, Jesus says this in um, 14.6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So only the priests could enter the tabernacle proper, and only the high priest could enter the most holy place. And that was just once a year. But the courtyard of the tabernacle was open to all, all the time. So by that single gate, each and every Israelite could come near to God. From the simplest among them all the way to the high priest, it was open every day to all men and women to seek forgiveness of their sin, to offer sacrifices, to fellowship, and to worship. The parallels to Jesus, I think, are seen in every part of those truths. All are invited to trust in his death and resurrection. And Jesus desires that everyone from every tribe and every nation would, by grace, through faith, trust in the sacrificial death and resurrection of his son. But we must choose to believe and choose to enter through his gate. So consider this. If you stepped through the entrance gate on the east side of the courtyard, you were actually at the furthest point there from the tabernacle itself because the tabernacle was on the far end, the far western side of the courtyard. The further you took steps through the gate, into the courtyard and toward the tabernacle, the closer you came to God's presence. So if Jesus is our gate or our doorway into God's presence, and I do not want to just stop once I cross that threshold. I want to keep heading toward glory. The tabernacle complex, I think, can be a way for us to visualize our own spiritual maturity. 
of walking through the gates, like the beginning of our salvation story, where uh, we, through Jesus, were made right with God. Um, then that distance between the entrance gate and the tabernacle is something like our walk with God. If the glory and majesty and beauty of God is most concentrated there at the tabernacle, then I don't want to be hanging out there just by that entrance gate very long. And I know you don't want to either. I want to be walking toward God with these purposeful and deliberate steps. Those deliberate steps that we take every day to trust God, to... uh, to live by the truth of his word, to turn away from sin, to love him, to love others, those steps move us closer toward him. Our salvation is secure once and forever once we trust Christ and walk through that gate. But our spiritual maturity requires that we walk with him and toward him. So why would we settle for hanging out at that entrance gate when there is so much more to be had? So let us be women who walk through his gate and who seek his glory daily. Well, so far in our study of the tabernacle, we have looked at each individual object and its construction very carefully. I want to zoom out now for a few minutes. And with a bird's eye view, look at how the tabernacle and the courtyard Um, played into the arrangement of the camp that Israel made, each place that it stopped. We've got another picture here of what this might have looked like. Now, this is a very just crude outline and drawing, but what you see here in the center is um, the solid rectangle is the tabernacle, then you have the bronze laver, and then the bronze altar. Around that, the courtyard walls. Okay, so that's our orientation there, north, south, east, west. Just beyond that, you see the tribe of Levi, Uh, they camped, we're going to talk about this in a second, but they encamped directly around, all the way around, the tabernacle complex. Then beyond that, you had each of the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. So I want you to just sort of keep that picture in mind. I wish we had a, a more artistic rendering of that, but it gives you an idea of what their camp looked like. So just, you can just keep that in mind as we talk. Um, the why behind those locations actually goes all the way back to Jacob and his 12 sons. It's really interesting. We could spend, I think, several weeks just figuring all of that out. Um, It's actually another study for another day, but if you ever want to go back to look at the end of Genesis when um, Jacob blessed the um, 12 sons, it it plays into this. But even in the few verses we are about to read in uh, Numbers, there's some very important things to notice. So actually flip with me if you would, or you can just listen. We're going to go now ahead to the book of Numbers. It's um, just a couple of books past. Um, You've got Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And we're going to look at um, chapter 1 and verses 51 through 54. When the tabernacle is set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. Now, the Levites were the priestly tribe of Israel. And if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. The people of Israel should pitch their tents by their companies or tribes, each man in his own camp and each man by his own standard. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony so that they, there there may be no wrath on the congregation of the people of Israel. And the Levites shall keep guard over the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus did the people of Israel. They did according to all that Moses had commanded them. So the Levites encamped, like I said, closest to the tabernacle and they surrounded it. It was their job to guard, to dismantle, to carry, and then to reassemble the tabernacle each time um, the camp was moved. Their commute was short because they stayed so close to it, and they got to keep a really close eye on everything that was happening. It was their job to protect the sanctity of the tabernacle. So we're more about that in a minute. Now skip ahead to Numbers chapter 2, and you can follow along as I read verses 1 through 3. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard with the banners of their father's houses. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. 
Those to camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be at the standard of the camp of Judah by their companies. And we're going to stop right there. Now, if we went on and read the rest of chapter 2, you would see that uh, God had a specific placement for each tribe of Israel. It was not haphazard where they're placed. But what is most important for us, I think, to look at here is that... um, the, the, the position of the tribe of Judah. Judah's spot was at the center of the east side, and that means their encampment was always directly across that entrance gate of the courtyard. It was the most honored position among the tribes other than the Levites who were closest in. So why did Judah get to have this position of honor? One reason is because of the 12 tribes, Judah had the most men of fighting age and therefore were considered the strongest of the tribes. As Israel moved toward the promised land, they were encountering many enemies along the way. They were considering themselves an army, and strength and numbers mattered a great deal. And because of their strength and their might, they were positioned strategically to protect the tabernacle from danger. If invaders came after any part of the tabernacle, all of the tribes were going to pitch in and fight. But Judah had the honor of being on the front lines, so to speak, of that force. King David, that great leader of Israel, will come from the tribe of Judah, as would Jesus. Look with me at Revelation 5, 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Now, early in their history, the men of Judah were leaders and protectors of God's people, and Jesus was the greatest one of them all. I want you to notice something else. In verse 2, we read that Israel was to camp facing the tabernacle on every side. So when you got up and you opened your tent flap every morning, there was a tabernacle right out there in front of you, and you would remember that God was near and that all of life was to be centered around him. It would remind Israel that he was great and that he was glorious and that he was real and that he was present among them, just as he is with us today. When we think of the purpose with which God instructed his people to pitch their tents facing him, we are reminded that he desires for our lives to be oriented and centered on him so that he can guide us, so that he can direct our lives for our good and for his glory. So I wonder, is there something that's blocking your view of God today? If so, move it. Is there something that you need to rearrange in your life so that your priority or your schedules can give you more time to see him and to seek him? It's worth the effort. Or is there an area of your life where your plans and ways are more important than his? Consider where Israel dwelt uh, and around God's glory. It was his idea for our lives to be oriented toward him because he knows our frailties and how easily we go astray and that any lasting joy or peace we have um, comes from keeping him at the very center of our lives just as he was at the center of Israel for all of their days. It is by God's grace that he dwelt there among his people in the tabernacle. It is by God's grace that he tore down the walls of separation when Jesus came so that we could dwell with him. It's by his grace that he gives us, even now, protective boundaries um, through his word for our lives. And it's by grace that he uh, gives us purpose and direction when we orient our lives and center our lives on him. So guard your relationship with him, keep him at the center of your life, um, and God is good. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are holy, and you are pure, and you are good, and you are great, and even still, you desire to dwell among Um, sinful man 
Your grace and mercy, Lord, is amazing, and we are grateful for it. I pray that we would be women who have eyes to see um, you in our lives, Lord, that would have the will and desire to put you right in the center of our lives every day, Lord. There's no better place to be um, and no better thing that we could do with our lives. I pray your hand of blessing over each woman in this room as she goes forward today. I pray that you would illuminate the truth of your word, of your dwelling place, of the tabernacle to us every week this fall, God. And we just praise you for being such a good and glorious God. And it's in your holy name that we pray. Amen.